Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Congresswoman Norma Torres's human trafficking webinar. Um, we are joined today by leaders of this fight who will discuss um, their work to combat human trafficking and how these programs make a difference in our community. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Christina Jimenez of the Project Sister Family Services. Uh, we're joined by Officer Greg Jones, Jones of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, Guillermo Santiso with the Bureau of Victim Services of the LA County District Attorney's Office, Tamiko Chacon with Purpose Church, Lynn Morfeld, the CEO of California Hotel and Lodging Association, and last but certainly not least, Susan Patterson with the SoCal Faith Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Um, we're here to discuss how we can all be allies in the fight against human trafficking. Um, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to Congresswoman Norma Torres, who will give her opening remarks. Congresswoman. Thank you, Jacob, and um, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today on this call to discuss an issue that has plagued our community for much too long, and that's human trafficking. Uh, today, we will hear directly from experts working in the community. They will brief us about what human trafficking looks like, where it happens, and what we can do to work together to help prevent it. But first, we should call it for what it is, and that is modern day slavery. There, there are more enslaved people in the world today than at any point in history. And by next year, human trafficking is on track to be more profitable than the international drug trade. Human trafficking happens in our cities, in our shopping malls, and in our neighborhoods. Living right here in our community, there are people who are bought and sold, people who do not have basic rights or freedoms. In 2019, there were over 22,000 trafficking victims and survivors identified in the U.S. alone. Los Angeles is a major metropolitan transit hub, and the county and the surrounding area is a magnet for human traffickers. Los Angeles was ranked one of the top areas for human trafficking with the second most cases in the country. Pimps move their victims around in order to prevent them from establishing connections and to keep them completely dependent on their pimps for basic needs. It is common for traffickers to take their victims on a circuit from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, Pomona, Ontario, and San Bernardino. From 2017 to the beginning of 2020, San Bernardino County had 428 criminal investigations into human trafficking and rescued 250 victims. When human trafficking occurs, it is not only devastating for those involved, but it also harms our entire community. That's why we should care, all of us. Human traffickers, often use violence, drugs, and emotional abuse to entrap and control their victims. As a result, human trafficking can lead to increased levels of crime in our cities. These criminals prey on the most vulnerable members of our society, especially our children. Yes, our children. Human traffickers don't check IDs or, go, or only target adults, uh, men and women. Their most vulnerable targets are our kids. And in California, the average age for children who are forced into the commercial sex trade is 11 years old to 14 years old. You heard that right. We're talking about preteens in most cases. And once a child is involved in, sex, in the sex trade, they only live for an average of seven years. That means that their lives are cut short to survive only 18 to 21 years in their lives. These numbers are sickening. And with so many group homes and foster kids living right here in Pomona, we need to be vigilant that predators don't prey or target our kids. That is why this webinar is so important, both for the victims and our communities. It is our responsibility to do everything in our power to combat human trafficking and provide survivors with the services that they need to overcome and heal from this trauma. In Congress, I have championed and passed policies to regulate avenues of exploitation and better protect victims. 
As most immigrant victims enter the U.S. legally, I work to strengthen visa programs to ensure that they are not being abused as a tool for human traffickers. I also fought to increase funding for victim services by $8 million last year, which passed into law, bringing the total amount to $85 million available nationally. This year in the House, we secured another increase of $10 million. However, that legislation is pending in the state. There is no doubt that our community needs resources to combat this horrific crime. And I am not, and I am committed to making that a reality. But I'm also, I also recognize that we cannot police our way out of this alone. That is why we have invited community partners to participate on this call and share a little about the work that they are doing in this area. I hope to be able to convene us regularly to hear directly from you on what you are doing to help uh, the authorities on this issue. Over the past few years, our district has received close to a million dollars in federal uh, grant funding, which has funded programs like those in the Los Angeles County uh, Human Trafficking Task Force and the Pomona Police Department. And before I turn it over to our panelists, I wanna provide you with information on how you can reach my office. Visit my website at torres.house.gov to find a wide variety of resources, guides, and local supports available to you. Or call us at 909-481-6474. My office stands ready to assist you in any way that we can. Thanks again for joining us today, and I look forward to an informative discussion with the professionals that we have gathered here today on this very, very critical issue in our community. Jacob. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, first up on our panelists today, we have Christina Jimenez, who is with Project Sister Family Services. Uh, and she is here to give her presentation on their work uh, to end human trafficking. Christina. Good afternoon. Thank you, Congresswoman Torres, for that lovely overview. And definitely human trafficking is something that we struggle with here within the 35th Congressional District. I um, mean, it looks very different. It's not often what we see with, you know, children tied up. It does definitely also happen with adult survivors. And so it can definitely happen to anybody that is in your home or close to your heart. Um, and so human trafficking is modern day slavery, as Congresswoman had mentioned. And we wanted to give you a little bit more definition on what human trafficking is. Um, if we could go to the next slide, Jacob. Um, human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery. Oftentimes when we think of human trafficking, we think it's happening in another country. It's an international issue. It's not an issue that takes place here domestically within our own um, country, within our own state or within our own cities and counties. Um, however, trafficking is a um, forced fraud or coercion. It's a form of control. Um, traffickers will take control of a victim and use one of these methods to obtain the ultimate purpose is for commercial sex um, acts or labor service against the will of the victim. Oftentimes, this is by promising them a relationship, promising them um, help and assistance to get documentation if they are foreign, if um, it is that they are threatening the safety of their loved ones. Oftentimes we've worked with survivors that have shared that I stayed or I continued to be trafficked because they threatened to come after my family. They threatened to come after my younger siblings, my parents. They were threatening to come after our everything that we owned and we had. And so there is a very huge manipulation when we talk about sex trafficking and oftentimes it looks very different. Um, as mentioned, there are two forms of sex trafficking. If we could go to the next slide, we see it happening through sex trafficking and forced labor. Sex trafficking, it is taking place by um, escort services. It's happening in hotels and motels. It's happening on the internet through social media. We see postings on offer up on Craigslist, um, Backpage was really known for posting a lot of ads selling individuals um, to the trafficking um, world. Out in the streets, we might see individuals out there walking the streets and offering sex acts in exchange for money. Um, pornography, escort prostitution services, especially even at truck stops. 
when a trafficker is moving their victims from different city to city, trying to get them in another location, it is happening on the interstates. It is happening when we have truck drivers that are also helping in the transition of victims. We also see it happening within bars and clubs. Um, this is These are the places where you can see sex trafficking happen, but these are not the only limited places. It can also happen in a home where a child may have two parents and the parents are themselves trafficking children. So it's not always someone that is being held against their will that is shackled up and tied up, but it could even be happening within homes where ch the child may be going to school, maybe functioning as a normal individual, but they are being trafficked. When we talk about labor trafficking, it's domestic servitude, um, forcing individuals to provide a domestic service against their will without pay or without um, being rendered care. Um, agricultural work out in the fields, there's a lot of um, individuals that are working and are not getting paid for that service. Restaurants, we also see that there's individuals out there that are begging and pleading for jobs or for money. Um, even within the construction industry and the beauty and health industry. And so it's important to understand that human trafficking presents itself very differently. Um, we know that here in the city of Pomona, we are part of the blade for the circuit of sex trafficking that is happening in California. And I will be the first one to tell you that it looks very differently in Pomona than it does in Ontario. In Ontario, we're hearing that it's happening within the hotels, within the um, you know, it's happening through the airport and it's happening through the conference center. But in Pomona, you might be seeing it and a lot of people may distinguish it or say that it is prostitution, um, that there are people out there on the street and that it's by choice. And um, as it was mentioned earlier, the average age of entry is the age of 11 in California. Um, and what happens to that individual that has been trafficked since the age of 11? This is all they know, this is all they do. So when they age out of systems such as foster care, in group homes, you know, they as adults, this is the only thing they know how to do. And so they do go to the streets and it may be at will, but they have a history of trafficking. It's not at will. Um, can we go to the next slide? I apologize for that. Um, human trafficking is a billion dollar industry. Um, in 2011, there were 4 million victims in the United States. 14% of them were coming from Southern California. In Southern California, we have two of the hotspots on the FBI's watch list, which is Los Angeles and San Diego, which are very close and similar to us. Um, and we know that in um, 2017, the Pomona Police Department had nearly 300 arrests related to human trafficking. And this is, again, um, when we talk about sex trafficking, sex trafficking is contributing over $99 billion to this industry. So Project Sister Family Services is here for resources and support. Um, we have recently just founded the Inland Valley's Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force to provide resources to adult survivors. We acknowledge that the Alley County and San Bernardino counties have provided services to minors, but we are providing services to adults. So if there is a victim that has been identified by law enforcement or the district attorney's office, we can provide them with resources and we can be um, contacted. If we could go to the next slide. Um, we are helping with those basic needs that keep them in the life of, of trafficking. And so we could provide them with emergency shelter, case management, um, clothing, medical services, and we can be reached on our 24 hour hotlines. Um, if it is a child incident, they can call us at 626-966-4155. For sexual assault or any other type of sexual violent crimes, they can reach us at 909-626-4357 or follow us and engage with us on social media. Um, thank you very much for your time and we will be here for after. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation, Christina. Um, next up on our agenda, we do have uh, Deputy Greg Jones of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, and he's going to give an overview of human trafficking from the law enforcement perspective and what the county is doing to combat it. Deputy? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Congresswoman, I want to thank you on behalf of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department uh, and our county uh, for what you're doing to combat this sensitive issue of human trafficking. Um, I'm going to be speaking primarily from, and there is different forms of between labor and sex, but I'm going to be speaking from the sex trafficking aspect. Um, we, there's only so much we can do, um, and we're trying to do the best we can overall. So with as many participants uh, and attendees watching this, 
hopefully it can make a, a dent. Anything can help at this point. And education, and this is the most important part, is the knowledge. Um, so with that being said, um, what I'm going to be concentrating on is the, oh, give me one second, is the uh, aspects of the types of human trafficking. Um, and it's primarily of the sex trafficking. What we try to, to what we are trying to combat is the, uh, it's broken down into three different phases, the brothels, massage parlors, pimping, and prostitutes. Um, you'll hear terminology like the blade or the track. Um, and you'll also understand that this is something that they, it's working off the internet. It's attacking our young people. Um, it's also working off of uh, word of mouth. Um, even though COVID-19 has ravaged our nation and our world recently, as everyone knows, uh, the one thing that's continued and has not stopped is sex trafficking. Um, it's going after our young, young people. And as you've heard earlier, the age is always young, 11, 12 years old. Um, but the biggest things we can do is, is become educated as much as possible. One of the things that we are trying to combat is going after the, uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. We are trying to go after the, uh, the demand more than anything. Um, prostitution or sex has been around since the beginning of time. Um, and the one thing we really can combat is the demand aspect. And that's what we are trying to do in the law enforcement. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, it's, I want everyone to understand it is not just an LA, San Diego or San Bernardino issue. It's in every single county in the entire state of California. Um, there is not one area that, doesn't, that is not affected. As long as there, are, there is a hotel, a motel, uh, there's going to be prostitution. Um, within the last few years, um, the state has, in law enforcement, the state has kind of took a different direction. Um, we used to, um, when I've been in law enforcement about 18 and a half years and when I first started, prostitutes, they were seen as prostitutes. Within the last few years, the prostitutes are being viewed and treated as victims because real, that's really what they are, they're victims. Um, this is something that they're manipulated into. Um, there are some psychological issues that goes on with this. Um, to, for somebody to convince a young lady or even a young man uh, to do certain things with their body uh, in the form of money, and these individuals do not get any of the money, it, goes to, it primarily goes towards the pimp, um, is something that nobody can really understand. The victims come from various backgrounds, um, education. Unfortunately, a lot of the breeding ground for what we're seeing is in the foster care and the group home setting. Um, it's something that is, they're trying to combat, and you'll hear more about that later. The, the large percentage of suspects um, are going to be documented uh, gang members. A lot of them are violent and with a criminal history. Um, can you go to you know, the next slide? Thank you. Um, so when we talk about human trafficking, you've heard uh, what human trafficking is. But when we talk about pimping, uh, it's depriving of a living or whole or in part of another who works as a prostitute. And the pandering aspect is the enticement um, in the coercion by force or fraud or fear, uh, and the promise to work as a prostitute. Next slide. Um, so when I mentioned that we are looking at the, the prostitutes as victims, that's really what they are. And it's really hard. Um, I remember when I was uh, working on patrol, when the state kind of changed over, I had friends and associates and peers, we didn't understand what the preference was and why couldn't we just go and arrest them? And then when we were, had more education and more training about it, you really had to see, or they, we had the opportunity to see that uh, the victims were young. They're young girls. Um, they did not choose this lifestyle. Uh, they're groomed majority of the time. They struggle with, with fears um, and shame. There's a lot of support that goes into uh, dealing with victims of prostitution um, and trying to get them to understand that there is a better life out there later. Um, next slide. So when we come in contact with them, we are dealing with a few of the issues, the poor physical wellness, the mental illness, and the substance abuse. We're finding that these, these uh, victims are normally malnourished, they're dehydrated, um, they're exhausted, they have multiple STDs, um, they really don't know how to care for themselves. And it's, it's, it's hard for people to understand that, 
Um, they really, it's a psychological warfare that goes on. Um, and trying to get these young ladies and some of these young men out of this life is not easy. There's various numbers of how many contacts it takes for law enforcement to come in contact with the victim. Um, and it's averaged between, uh, I've heard as high as uh, in the mid 20s. So 20 contacts of dealing with somebody and telling them that, hey, look, this is a better life and what I can do for you. Because the, the prostitutes, the victims, they are told repeatedly, do not talk to law enforcement. Um, and a lot of times they will lie and everything else underneath the sun. So we do not ultimately um, affect what's going on with them. Next slide. So when we talk about obstacles with some of the victims, a lot of the victims, if you can believe it or not, they're aggressive and they're very combative. Um, they do not want help. Um, they're dealing with a, a wide variety of issues. Um, the victims are fear, fear, fearful, I'm sorry, uh, and they don't always want to provide information about what's going on. The traffickers have warned them and threatened them, uh, do not talk to the police. A lot of the times they will, they already know their personal information, their kids, their families, where they live. Um, they don't want to, the victims don't want to impact the rest of their families. Um, and it is also, it's a very tight community, if you can believe it or not. Um, the manipulation that goes on, and you can have one pimp, and he might have a, this is considered a stable, where you have multiple uh, victims or prostitutes um, under, under him. Within that, they manipulate these individuals to thinking that, the, traffic, the trafficker has their best interests at hand. And so it's a way that they can communicate. Uh, for the average individual that knows nothing about prostitution or nothing about trafficking, um, they, use lang they have their own language, um, they have their own value system. Um, there is a hierarchy from the pimp to the uh, head victim or head prostitute, and which is considered the, or identified as the bottom. Um, and there's rules and there's rules and regulations, even amongst other pimps. Can you go to the next slide? So what are we doing within our department? Um, we have the Human Trafficking Task Force. In the next slide. That task force, and I apologize, it's slow. Um, somebody changed my slides on me, um, but, and it is awfully slow, so I apologize. But our task force, go ahead, next slide. Our task force was created in 2017. Um, and originally it was Ontario Police Department, uh, a liaison for the FBI, a liaison for Homeland Security, um, the, our DA's office, our county, our sheriff's department, and also from the San Marino Police Department. Within the last few years, um, the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections has also um, been attached to the, and Redlands Police Department. And then we were able to uh, have two temporary deputies assigned to the task force. So right now it's, it's right at about 11. Can you go to the next slide? So these 11 individuals are responsible for our entire county. They're on call 24 hours a day. They, are, they get calls from multiple different agencies and entities. Um, whenever an officer or a group comes in contact with who's a victim, they will be called out. They serve the entire county. Um, they conduct undercover operations, they, con they conduct stings, um, but most of all, they conduct education, trying to help the girls. Um, and, I, and this is, it is, it is an issue dealing with young men and young ladies, but primarily what we are seeing is the young ladies. And I don't want anyone to think that it's only the young men are not involved because they are, but what we see and what our task force has seen, there's more young ladies than there is young men. Um, so next slide, please. So within the last couple of years, um, these 11 individuals on the task force, they've conducted about 428 uh, criminal investigations, as you can see, over 175 operations. Uh, they've been called out 106 times. The one thing I really wanna stress is, I wanted to look at the bottom, the rescued victims. Uh, as of recently, I think we're right around 263 victims rescued. Notice I didn't say prostitutes, but I said victims. Um, and 94 of those, almost 100 of those are, are juveniles or young girls. Um, it does make a big difference. Next slide. Or you can go to the next one also, I'm sorry. 
Um, I don't want anyone to think that because COVID is here that these things are, are slowing down. Um, I just reached out to my counterpart in our task force and I've kind of updated some of the numbers, um, but it, it's not slowing down at all. The FBI recently shut down one of the major websites um, and now it's becoming even harder, but the task force between our county and LA, um, Orange County is still working very diligently to bring an end to this. So on the prosecution side, our, our county has three DAs assigned just to handle these types of cases. Um, it, is, it is something that we feel is very vital between our district attorney and our sheriff, um, and along with the other chiefs of police within our county. Um, a lot of the evidence that is collected during this investigation is very extensive. It has about as much discovery or evidence as some uh, most murder trials. In addition to that, um, it's, some of the laws um, are kind of outdated, to be very honest with you. A lot of the laws or violations are considered misdemeanors. Um, and that's one of the things that we, I think we really need to kind of change. And Congresswoman, to be very honest with you, that's where you can really make the biggest difference. Introducing laws that can change uh, our young people in a more positive way to stop some of the, the issues that we're having. Um, our, all of our members on our task force are considered expert, experts and they give expert testimony all over the county and even state. Next slide. This is what happens when you let somebody use your PowerPoint. So I apologize. Um, now really when it comes to our task force, they provide so much training um, to all of our officers within our county, either at the academy or through advanced training. Um, and I, I'm just gonna list a few of this. Um, from briefing trainings to all of our departments, um, so our new trainees and our officers, our veteran officers can at least have an understanding of what's going on. Um, from the first responders, our hospitals and um, hospital staff. Um, so when there's uh, medical providers and they come in contact with these young girls, they understand what to look for. Um, and I'll get just a real quick example. When the girls, when they go in to be seen, the pimp will have a lot of control over them. So they're always going to be looking at their pimp or the bottom for direction. Um, so that's one of the things you can really watch out for. Also, our task force gives about a 40-hour child abuse investigations, eight-hour investigation course, eight-hour post-mandated um, learning domain, which they teach in the academy, our supervisors course, and also our California Narcotics Officers Association course. Um, they're also looking at doing future um, working with the hotel staff and the casino casino related training. Um, and I know there's someone, uh, one of our panelists is from the state for our, our hotels association, which is extremely important. Next, next slide, please. So when I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a strong gang connection, um, the gangs are changing. And drugs are still part of it, but the human trafficking aspect is even more. Um, it's something that the, the victims are treated as property and they essentially are treated as trash. They're disposable. Um, they get them at a young age and by a, uh, within a few years, they age out. So they can just let them go. The girls, what we're finding is that the young girls, they, when they go to school, um, you're looking at element, or I'm sorry, middle school at times, but high school and even college. And when we, they want them to go to class, they don't want to disrupt their lives. So the girls will leave during the weekend and then come back a few days later or they'll disappear. So we're looking at a lot of our runaway juveniles, uh, which is being affected. Next slide. It has a strong connection when we, what we are seeing in law enforcement is to the violent crime connection. So when they're looking at um, crime as a whole, so our robberies, our shootings, our stabbings, our homicides, they're finding that there's a lot of, uh, of cross-reference between this. Um, I know one of our local cities within the last few years, they, they attached or they connected approximately eight murders were, were directly related to uh, human trafficking. And that's not to put a, a negative eye on that city because this happens everywhere. It's just one of those things that we've identified. Um, whenever you're going to have a high number of motels or, or hotels, you're going to have prostitution. And unfortunately in our county, since we are one of the major hubs within Southern California, because we have direct access to Vegas, 
Um, it is really considered like a pipeline. Uh, can you go on the next slide? So what we're seeing is this. We work with orga other organizations um, as CASE, which is the Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation. Um, it is an entity or organization that has the complete wraparound service. Um, we also work directly with, I'm sorry, CASE is pretty much, or it's made up of multiple dis different disciplines between Department of Children and Family Services, our probation, our county's probation, our district attorney's office, and multiple different agencies. Um, there are, there's also, they also provide a better response from uh, our CSEC, which is the Commercialized Sexual Exploitation of Children. Um, go ahead, next slide. And what we're finding is this, the task force is, is um, impacting um, more of the enforcement side. Um, so as as what we're looking at is the suspects, they have a major fear of being caught, especially within our county. Um, we, have, we have heard that our DA's office will offer, um, will offer them a certain amount of time um, as a plea deal. Um, and the traffickers know they, it's, it's, it'll be in their best interest because usually the investigations are so thorough. They do not want to go to, they don't, they usually do not want to try to go to court and prolong it out. Um, especially go to trial. Um, nobody in the public wants to hear about their little girl or a young child um, being used for sex. Uh, so the biggest thing is a positive impact on the community and relationship with law enforcement is that we are trying to get the word out as much as possible. Um, we do a, a lot of community training, a lot of uh, misconceptions are out there about like, what they consider prostitutes. And a lot of the public does not understand that these, these individuals are victims. They need help. Uh, next slide. So just quickly, um, the Johns are tricks. They're using, you know, they're using males between the ages 18 to 70. Um, this is the demand aspect. What we're finding is that um, they're made up of all races. Uh, most are married and with children. Next slide. And what we can really do is we can try to do work hard, uh, more diligent on is the prevention of it. Uh, webinars like this um, is outstanding, but the biggest part is just the experience and the training for our first responders, our fire department, police department, um, EMS, nurses, school teachers, school counselors, CPS, or child protective services. Um, we're learning that we have to educate the public as much as possible and that the victims are truly, I'm sorry, the prostitutes are truly victims um, and they need to be identified as such. The one thing we're trying to go after more than anything is the, um, the tackle the demand idea. Uh, next slide. We work at multiple, multiple organizations, but one of, the, uh, one of our key organizations is Open Door. Um, I listed some of our key numbers for the anti-human trafficking hotline, um, our youth crisis, crisis hotline, uh, the email for, or the website, I'm sorry, for Open Door. Next slide. And in addition to in our, within our county, we have the 211 system, um, and you can it's it's readily available for the public. It's a 24 hour, seven days a week hotline. Um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, their email and their phone number is there. The National Human Trafficking Hotline, in addition to Case, um, with Angel Magdalenas as the um, coordinator. And I'm sorry, there was a misprint on the email for her email. It's actually Angel Magdalenas. Uh, at the county's email. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Deputy, for that presentation. Uh, next up, we do have Guillermo Santiso with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. He is the deputy in charge of the human sex trafficking section. Um, and he's here to also provide some additional perspective on, on law enforcement uh, efforts to combat human trafficking. Guillermo? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Congresswoman Torres, for um, having me here. And it's, a, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. I am the supervisor, or what they call the deputy in charge of the human sex trafficking section of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Um, I supervise three senior deputy district attorneys that are responsible for prosecuting, vertically prosecuting, 
the human sex trafficking cases involving adults and minors in Los Angeles County. We have cases in Lancaster, uh, many of our cases are downtown, Airport Court, San Fernando, Van Nuys, Pomona, Long Beach, so uh, we have cases everywhere. So I, I know some of this has been discussed um, with um, our, our, our wonderful panelists, but uh, what I've seen um, in my work, and I've been doing this for over five years now, um, human sex trafficking cases involve um, obviously commercial sex work, right? Um, oftentimes domestic violence. It's very common for a trafficker or a pimp to enter into a dating relationship with a victim, um, grooms the victim, and then slowly turns them out to become a commercial sex worker. We also have uh, sexual abuse and assault, both inflicted by the trafficker and by the sex purchasers. Um, as you heard from Deputy Jones, um, most of the time I've seen that our defendants have some sort of gang connections. And unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle with the victims in our cases. Um, I have, I'm responsible for basically receiving all the cases to review. I review a case presented to me by law enforcement and I make the decision, am I gonna file it? Does there need to be some further investigation or do we unfortunately not have enough evidence uh, to move forward? And I've come across the same victim numerous times. Right now, the deputies I supervise have over 60 um, open human sex trafficking cases. And I would say probably about 10 of those involve uh, the same victims, unfortunately. Next, next slide, please. So human trafficking, as you've heard, is essentially separated in two areas. Um, we have labor trafficking, and that's for services. Uh, this section that I supervise deals predominantly with sex trafficking. But something to note um, at this point in time is uh, labor trafficking, which is handled by a separate section of the LA County District Attorney's Office, um, we don't see a lot of those cases. And it's not because it's not happening, it's rampant out there, but it's not seen like you see it with commercial sex work. Commercial sex work, you go to the blade, the track, the high commercial sex area, and you can see uh, young ladies working, right? Uh, soliciting potential customers, or you go to the, uh, the motels in high commercial sex areas, and you can see commercial sex going on with your own eyes. Uh, but with labor trafficking, frequently that's behind closed doors. And I think that's what makes it so difficult first for that to be reported to law enforcement, but then to get the investigation going, which then can lead to a prosecution. Um, so um, that's labor trafficking. Now, as you heard with sex trafficking, uh, we have one for adult or one law that deals with adult human sex trafficking. And then we have a separate law, uh, two subsets of law that deal with um, human sex trafficking of a minor. And just to put it in, in perspective, um, our legislators have given us very powerful tools to deal with these types of cases. So for instance, you have a, a defendant that commits human sex trafficking of an adult, the maximum time they can receive in state prison is 20 years. That doesn't even involve somebody who has um, a lengthy criminal history or what we call strike priors, which causes their exposure to be raised. Um, but just somebody with no record, they could receive up to 20 years in the state prison. Now for human sex trafficking of a minor, um, in a situation where you're not dealing with force, fear, duress, coercion, the maximum time you can receive is, uh, in state prison is 12 years. And I wanna make something known um, at this point in time, because people will not often look at me and say, well, how does an adult trafficker get 20 years, but uh, a, a trafficker of a child can get 12 years? At this point of the discussion, it deals with the violence or the fear or the fraud that's perpetrated by the, the trafficker. You need the fraud, the fear, the violence to be classified as an adult trafficker but you are out there trafficking a juvenile. And uh, to put it in simple terms, you have a trafficker that's not um, forcing the juvenile uh, to go out there and work. That's being the, the boyfriend that's saying, hey, go out there and make some money for us, but isn't compelling overtly that victim to go work. That particular defendant can receive 12 years. But 
you raise the conduct by a trafficker against a minor with force fear they're abusing the victim while they're trafficking them they're forcing the victim to go out there and engage in commercial sex work the victim tells the trafficker hey i can't work today i'm tired i don't feel good whatever the case may be and the trafficker says hey if you don't do it i'm gonna go uh, i'm gonna beat you up i'm gonna go hurt your mom things of that nature that causes the trafficking to rise to the level of force and fear and therefore that person is punishable by up to 15 years to life I'm in state prison, as you heard Deputy Jones uh, discuss earlier. So these are very good statutes for us, very powerful. Next slide, please. So sex trafficking in Los Angeles. You heard Deputy Jones from San Bernardino talk about some of this. It's not unique to Los Angeles, right? What we see. What do we see here in Los Angeles? It's very common for all sorts of commercial sex workers. Um, these, these victims are truant teens. They're runaways from home, from group home, from foster homes. And it's very frustrating as, as a parent, as a prosecutor, as a member of our community, that you can have a victim who's contacted working um, in commercial sex, they're in a group home. Uh, they're part of the DCFS system, for instance. They get picked up, interviewed, they disclose who their trafficker is, they get taken back to the group home. It's very common by the next day they're out working again with, with another trafficker, with another pimp, sometimes even with the same one, um, that they had discussed with law enforcement. So it's a vicious cycle, as I, as I explained to you. Um, the average age of girls in our LA juvenile system is 15 years, but we have cases with, with victims as young as 11, 12, 13. Unfortunately, that's very common. Uh, we see a lot of our victims, they were sexually abused as children. Um, also, as you heard, very common that they have drug, alcohol issues, and it's very common uh, for them to have mental health issues as well. Traffickers, pimps are expert manipulators. They can walk into a room, they can survey a bunch, of, um, a bunch of people. They have this innate ability to pick the weakest one in that room and to start working their persuasion, the manipulation on that person to get them on their team. As I discussed, um, a lot of them are in the foster care system and it's a revolving door. They don't have a permanent home um, to return to. And also what happens in, in, in what we see in these cases is you have a trafficker who on social media will post this glamorous lifestyle on their Instagram, on their TikTok, whatever the case may be, and they befriend as many people as possible. You got a 12 year old, 13 year old who's looking for some attention, uh, somebody to take care of them, uh, somebody to give them uh, you know, a place to lay their head because they don't want to be at their group home because they're tired of the uh, you know, their problems they're having with uh, the adults or uh, the other kids in the group home. Um, and that's how these traffickers uh, get them to uh, get interest in them. So they use social media to uh, pose this glamorous lifestyle. They use it as a recruitment method. And once they get just one girl, you know, or one boy, they can have a hundred friends. It just takes that one person to bite and then they can start working the manipulation and their persuasion on them. Um, a lot of these girls uh, don't have male figures in their life. I mean, it's, it's the, the victims call their pimps or their traffickers daddy. There's a reason for that. They don't have a male figure in their life. Their pimp is their male figure. And as the deputy said, uh, human trafficking is not um, unique to, to females. I haven't quite put my, um, haven't quite put my finger on it, but the investigations related to, to male trafficking, um, we just haven't seen it. I don't know if it's because it's not out in the public, similar to labor trafficking, uh, but we just frequently see uh, the females engage in commercial sex work. And like I said earlier, uh, victims frequently think that they're in love with their trafficker and the trafficker uses that to exploit them. Next slide, please. So where do we see sex trafficking in Los Angeles? We have what we call tracks or blades, high commercial sex areas. Unfortunately, in Los Angeles, we have several. Uh, we have in the Valley, uh, in Compton, Long Beach. Uh, we have the Western track, the Figueroa track. And as you heard earlier, it's, it's a circuit. They can go in one day. They can start in the Sepulveda track. They can go to um, the track in, in Los Angeles, the Figueroa track. They can go out to Pomona, the whole track. And then they can end up in San Bernardino, all in one day's work. They're just going wherever the most activity is. 
and where there's no law enforcement. Um, I already discussed this as aspect of the slide, but I will mention, um, I've seen cases where victims are recruited just sitting at a bus station, a train station. They're waiting to get a ride home. Trafficker sees them, they're alone, they're young, they look like they may need some help, um, and there they go. You know, they, they start talking to them and just saying the right things uh, that um, gets the victim's attention. And I'll just notate a couple things um, as far as what the office is. So our district attorney, Jackie Lacey, did create the human sex trafficking section in 2016. I recognize the need to have specialized prosecutors deal with these cases. Um, it is a pleasure to supervise the prosecutors that I do because they're very knowledgeable in this area. Um, they all have sex crimes experience uh, and they've been in the office, all of them at least 10 years, so they know what they're doing and we're very successful with our cases. Our office also has the Bureau of Victim Services. We have um, two designated victim advocates that assist us with our cases. When a victim comes in, whether it's for an interview or for a preliminary hearing or trial, these victim advocates can sit with them, can support them, can offer them services. If there's a service that we can offer, job placement, um, relocation, things of that nature, our specially trained victim advocates can then put them in contact with these great um, NGOs that we have out in our community to assist these victims. So um, that in summary is a, um, an overview of what we do here in Los Angeles. And thank you again. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Guillermo. Uh, next up, uh, we have Tamiko Chacon uh, with Purpose Church. I mean, she's here uh, to discuss a little bit about how parents can be aware of this issue and, and what they can do to help. Tamiko? Yes, well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Congresswoman Torres, so much for having me. Um, so Everyone Free is um, an organization based here in Pomona. We started out of Purpose Church, um, which has been here in the city for 150 years. Um, I'm on staff here at the church um, as a pastor. Um, and as we've mentioned, the city of Pomona is notorious as an area for um, pimps to bring their girls, to bring their victims, and for men to come, and for the Johns to come and buy sex. And um, unfortunately, our church um, is located uh, right here on Holt. Not unfortunately, but unfortunately, it's it's part of the track. And so um, we're here on Holt and Gary. And so for as long as we've been here, we've really seen prostitution just be rampant right here in front of our church. Um, and in particular, for many, many years at all times of the day, day and night, morning, afternoon, evening, um, we would see women that were um, being prostituted. Um, on many occasions, we would see uh, women literally sitting like on our church property um, and their traffickers um, would come by and on one occasion we saw a trafficker come by shoot up his victim um, and using drugs to keep her coerced keep her under his control um, and then send her out um, to work and earn money for him um, and so I think we really believe that it's our responsibility as a part of this community as a faith group uh, to do something about that to end it um, and so that's how we started everyone free which um, we have a three-pronged approach to ending trafficking. So we want to raise awareness about trafficking, what it is, what it looks like. Um, so that's why we are so eager to be involved in webinars and events like this. Um, second is we want to work to prevent exploitation and um, also to serve survivors. Um, so in particular, um, with preventing exploitation, we really identified as many of the, the presenters have shared today um, that the, the most vulnerable in our community are those that are young. And so we really felt like we needed to educate students on what trafficking looks like, um, on what a trafficker looks like, on how traffickers might um, 
lure them into the life. Um, so we developed a curriculum and we um, for many years now have been presenting that to students. Um, we speak to about 800 to 1000 students a year. Um, it's all voluntary. Um, our whole organization is based is made up of volunteers. And um, so we train our volunteers, many are um, anything from college students to retired educators to just people that just feel very passionate about this. Um, and so we go where we're invited, whether it's by a teacher or a school administrator um, to come and speak to their students. Um, I would say on average, um, we always uh, do a survey with our students before the presentation and afterwards kind of um, to assess their knowledge, their understanding understanding and their experience with trafficking um, and it's very interesting over half of them um, are very familiar with um, what trafficking is what it looks like but many of them have come in contact with or know somebody who's come in contact with a trafficker um, whether it's through you knowing we've talked about um, gang involvement some of them um, it's through knowing people that are involved in gangs or just um, in their community um, in particular we had a student tell us that they were um, approached by a trafficker on their way home from school someone who was following them um, on their way home they ran into a flower shop um, there was a florist that was open and they ran in as this trafficker was following them on their way home um, and so we see this as vital it's so important to educate students um, but one thing I wanted to mention today and I, I assume that there are parents or guardians that are on the webinar is right now with students being at home and being online more than ever as a parent as a guardian you need to be vigilant um, and be aware of what your student is doing online um, and so there are wonderful resources out there um, a couple organizations that I recommend one of them is missing kids so um, the National Center for missing and exploited children um, they have some great resources through their um, net smarts campaign um, to educate yourself um, and also to talk with your student about online safety um, and then the second is shared hope international they also have some amazing resources um, but please 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 talk to your students um, even your elementary students about online safety because um, traffickers will use um, video games, chat rooms, all uh, social media um, to lure your kids um, and to exploit them. Um, and then um, I did want to share a little bit about how when, one of the ways that we serve survivors. Um, and so in partnership with the uh, district attorney's office here in Pomona, um, through the Pomona courts, um, we've, we've created a program. It's a diversion program. Um, so for adult women who are arrested on a prostitution charge, uh, loitering and, and intent, um, if they are nonviolent, um, they are offered um, to come to our program and we use a curriculum called Ending the Game and it was written by survivors and um, th uh, therapists and educators. Um, and what Ending the Game does, it identifies how, um, the, how traffickers will um, control their victims. Um, they refer to the life as as the game, and so for many of for ma the majority of the victims, they don't see themselves as a victim. So um, most victims don't self-identify. I think somebody mentioned this already. So um, a victim doesn't just walk up to to law enforcement and say, "Hey, can you please help me? Um, this person's forcing me into prostitution." That doesn't happen. They don't see themselves as a victim. So what needs to happen is they need to actually spend time breaking those bonds that they've developed with their trafficker and begin to realize how they are being exploited, how they are have been coerced, how they are being abused, um, and begin to understand that before they actually be able to leave the life. Um, they say that women who are involved in um, prostitution or being trafficked may leave the life and return to it up to seven times before they finally um, escape. And so 
um, that's what um, our curriculum, the curriculum does, and that's what the amazing uh, women that we have that um, have come out of um, experiences of addiction and and all kinds of things. How they now they themselves are free, and so now they are facilitating these classes and helping women um, find freedom. Um, one one of our graduates we just graduated a group of, of women and one of our graduates um i'll just refer to her as mary um she came from a situation where um, her father was very abusive and very controlling and so she ran away from her home um she ran away and she was discovered by a trafficker by a pimp and immediately he began to um, abuse her, control her. Um, she left her child with her parents so she could go and work for him. Um, but she didn't see herself as being victimized. She saw this as someone who was her boyfriend who loved her and cared about her and she was just working to support the two of them. Um, and um, upon um, graduation from our program, one of the things that she said was, you know, he used to buy me gifts and went and after i went through this these classes i realized wait a minute i was earning the money for him to buy those gifts for me i didn't realize that how i was being abused and how he was exploiting me um so that was about six months ago she's still out of the life um we keep in touch with her um our prayer is that she'll continue to stay out of the life she's gotten her child back um which is a huge step for her um so that's a success story for us we pray that that she'll continue to live a life of freedom and a new uh, successful um and a successful life so um those are just some of the things that we do and um, we're really grateful for the involvement as i said um, in support of the community we're completely run by volunteers and so um, we're very grateful for all that um, the community does and um, to support what we do so Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that, Tamiko. Uh, our next panelist that we have today is Lynn Moorfield. He is with the California Hotel and Lodging Association. Uh, he's the president and CEO, and he is here to discuss um, what the industry is doing to, to end human trafficking and uh, the tra training that they provide for that purpose. Lynn? Great, thank you, Jake. I very appreciate that. Um, most of all, thank you, Congress Member um, Torres. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, I guess, continue to shine a light on, on this topic and for everything that you do. Um, the, the goals and the, uh, the results that you've gotten to date have been spectacular. So thank you for that. Um, and to all the speakers, um, this is everywhere. So from a hotel industry perspective, we try and do our best to not have this in our hotels. So we're, they need to go somewhere um, and hotels are likely candidates. So the best thing that we can do is train them and tell them what to do. So um, I've been pretty passionate about this now for gosh, uh, a long time um, in trying to get this out. This is not a market segment for hotels to be in, um, whether it's economy, luxury, or anything else. We don't want to see this. And so the best way for us to do it was to train up um, everyone and then connect law enforcement um, and also um, the other folks that we've heard from, so the social providers, the community resources, the county resources, et cetera, um, and to make the connection and to make it real. So um, in, the, in the lodging industry, really, we want them to know the signs. So, you know, if someone comes in with a plastic shopping bag from a grocery store with their things in it, Okay, that's usually not a leisure guest. Someone that comes in and asks for multiple keys for the room, that's not a guest. Okay, so that is someone that's working, someone that's involved in human trafficking. So we see this all the time um, and our best uh, method is one, look at housekeeping and how they do it um, and really try and train them for the things to look for. So the housekeepers are the eyes and ears of the property, they're gonna interact with the guests more than anyone else there. So the front desk, the person, uh, if, it's, if it's valet or they have someone out front, they're gonna see it for a little bit, but it's gonna be housekeeping that is generally gonna know what's going on. So just teaching them little things and what to look for and to say something. 
Okay, you don't have to call 911 every time. Um, you talk to your supervisor and find out what it is, um, and then your supervisor will take appropriate action on it. So um, we've had uh, human trafficking victims come speak to our hotels. Um, we've done seminars, we've done training. We've got a bunch of other stuff I'll talk about in a little bit. But really the big thing is to engage them. So that's what we found. So when they're hanging around the lobby and doesn't quite look like they belong there, um, ask them if you can help them. Ask them if they're waiting for someone. Ask them what's going on. Engage them. Whether it makes them uncomfortable and leave um, is one thing, but also you're going to also humanize that person that hasn't been humanized for quite a while. So that human touch is really, really important. Um, everybody does this training now. Um, all the major brands have it, um, virtually every hotel has it. Um, and as I mentioned, this isn't a Southern California problem, it's not a Los Angeles problem, this is an international problem. So um, we see a lot coming up. Um, there's also a human trafficking organization called the I-5 Freedom Network um, because we know that they're going north to south and they're stopping along the freeway and they need a place to stay overnight. So we're watching for those things. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we took the bold step of actually um, regulating our own industry, uh, which is not something that happens too terribly often um, and certainly doesn't happen a whole lot in the, in the hotel industry. We wanted to standardize the training, make sure that it was effective, and also make sure that they repeated the training every two years. We wanna make sure that this stays top of mind, that people are thinking about it and this is what's going on. That's why when we have our conferences, we have a session on human trafficking. We talk to our housekeepers about it. We do newsletter articles about it. that reputation just keeps it top of mind for them so that they can know what to look for. Okay. We're not law enforcement, we're not social workers, we're hotel folks. We want to look at this, identify it, and then let the professionals handle it from there. So a law that we worked on with Senator Atkins out of San Diego, um, Senate Bill 970, uh, requires training um, within the first six months of an employee hire. Usually now it's part of the onboarding process, and then every two years they train as well. Um, next slide. Okay, in terms of our partnership, we've partnered with a, a company called Best, um, and we work with Polaris, we work with EPCAT, our national association also has um, a, a program, no room for, for trafficking, et cetera. And we've even gone the extra step. We have one, two, three staff that are actually went up and did a train the trainer program so that they're able to offer the training to hotels. So we wanted to kind of exponentially grow our reach with human trafficking training and make sure that they're out there. Then we offer signage, compliance, um, information in multiple languages. Uh, we even came up with um, uh, cards that are like four by eight that fit in the top of a housekeeping card. So they can keep the indicators front and center and they're usually in English and Spanish and sometimes in simplified Chinese. And so the housekeeper has the top of mind and so they can see always. And so the, we just wanna remind them, okay? We don't wanna put a sticker on the card that says stop human trafficking, but we wanna let them know what's going on with it. So we're trying to work with people that have experienced human trafficking, can relay their stories um, or know how to do this and how to identify this and, and keep bringing it to the forefront. Um, next slide. Okay, so we've partnered on a national basis with this. Um, our national association, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, um, it has a nationwide program um, and has a, just a ton of people that are doing this. All the major hotel brands, again, are doing this. And we want to make sure that, um, that, that we're out there in the forefront. Um, we're going to continue to support this through social media, our contact with our members, anything that we possibly can do. Uh, one thing I want to leave you with, and that is um, I have uh, two sons, um, and one is a 17-year-old water polo player. Um, last week, him and his friend were swimming at the pool doing laps, and he was approached by someone, told him that he could make uh, $200 a day, and if both of them came, they could make $500 between the two of them, so $250. Okay? My son, after hearing about this for the last, what, four years, maybe five years, was still like, hey, dad, this guy wants to put me on TV. 
I'm like, no, that's not quite it. Let's call the police and here, let me sit down and we'll have you learn a little bit about human trafficking. So even when you think that you even know and that your own kids would recognize this, um, and I think I've provided a good home life for them, it's just so um, unsuspecting. Uh, and it's really a threat that's out there. And when they're starting at 11 years old to 14 years old, um, that's tough to see. So we're gonna try and keep this up as much as we can um, until it's gone. So we don't wanna see this in our hotels ever again. Um, and I'll do everything in my power to keep educating the industry um, and the communities and working with law enforcement and everyone else to make sure that we can do the most that we possibly can. So to all the other speakers on this and Congress member Torres, thank you very much for your support and for your efforts in this. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for that presentation. Uh, last on our agenda today, uh, we do have a guest from the Southern California Faith Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Uh, Susan Patterson is here to speak a little bit about what they're doing um, to, to end this horrible crime. Susan? Yes, hi everyone. Um, Jacob, do you have my, I don't see my presentation. Okay, very good, thank you so much. All right, um, yes, I'm gonna talk about what the faith community can do to do their part. So I have an organiz, uh, I have several websites. One is SoCal Faith Coalitions, which offers a platform for active churches to network with each other and share their events. I also have all the task force meetings for seven counties. Um, so people can go and start feeling connected. The, one of the advantages the human traffickers have over us is they're organized and we're not. So the purpose is to get everyone connected so that we can empower each other. And on September 19th, I do have a call similar to this, but this is just for people in the faith community who want to learn what other churches are doing, similar to what Tamika Purpose Church is truly a champion in the faith community with regard to everything they're doing and a perfect example of what can be done. So next. So according to, this is actually the LA County Human Trafficking Task Force. They, they have said at their meetings multiple times that law enforcement is 3% of the solution, nonprofits are seven, and the community is 90. In other words, we're not gonna arrest our way out of this problem. Like Officer um, Greg Jones talked about, they have 11 officers for all of San Bernardino. Similar, to, that's similar in LA. San Diego has 12, Santa Barbara has one. It's really up to us, the community, to take this on if we're gonna end it. Uh, academics are predicting that human trafficking is gonna surpass drugs in size within two years. So we really need to step up. Next. Next. Thank you, sorry. The main role, <coughs> it's awkward not to be able to <laughs> make, have my own PowerPoint go forward. So the main role of the faith community is to prevent human trafficking. So 51% of people in the US attend a faith community. So we do have the resource to address this problem if we mobilize. If we don't prevent it, it will never end. So here's just some things like Officer Jones talked about. We need to educate and raise awareness. Churches can do a Freedom Sunday where they have tables with flyers and uh, it's really fun. This is a great thing for churches to do. Next. Uh, one church started a bulletin column entitled, Did You Know? that would list out every week tips for how we can protect children from being exploited by predators. Next. Um, other churches have gotten their pastor's permission to show a 15-minute video to all their small groups. A lot of churches have small groups. So what, uh, this is Saddleback did this with, uh, they have over 3,000 small groups and they're going to be showing this video and then letting people know they have a ministry at their church so that they know how to get involved. This to me is the ideal model. Um, also, churches have had me speak during their service and then invited people to come to a training. I think one of the best things I've seen is this one pastor had me speak for like about 10 minutes at the church. And then as soon as the service was over, he had invited everyone to the next room where he bought lunch for everyone. And everyone got up and went over there and I did a one hour training. So that was perfect. Thank you. And um, I do have uh, my throughgodsgrace.com website. I have about 15 different trainings that we're putting up. One is a training for parents. It tells you everything you need to know on how to protect your child, when to give them a cell phone, when they're not ready for a cell phone, all the tricks these teens have, like having a second Instagram account so the parents are only monitoring the good account and then they're, you know, getting in trouble on the second account. 
And then I have a training for youth group. And uh, we've done this training for parents to over 3,000 parents and over 5,000 teens. Uh, and the number of teens who have come forward to tell us that they're being exploited blows my mind. Because most of the time we think, okay, it's foster kids or trouble kids or runaways. I mean, they're going after everyone. And in some ways, children of, quote, healthy families can be very naive. So they're also vulnerable. Thank you, next. Um, the, where the churches are uniquely qualified is to recruit good foster parents, and that is the best protection from a foster child from becoming a victim. Over 70% of victims are from the foster care system. Um, I myself am a foster parent. Could you go back? Sorry, Jacob. Thank you. Um, I introduced a uh, program to the LA Catholic Archdiocese, which they did they had a presentation, 60 presentations done at 32 churches, and they recruited 200 foster parents. Because what I know about foster parenting is this, is many people feel called, but they have concerns. They think if they're renting, they can't be a foster parent. If they're working, they can't be a foster parent, and that's not true. So I invited them to just have a foster care agency do a five-minute talk at the end of the service saying, if you feel called or have questions, come see us at the table outside. And by doing that, they recruited 200 foster parents. So this is a very powerful way to protect these kids. Thank you. Okay, next. All right, now this is the demand side and um, Officer Jacobs talked about, we really need to address demand. And I'm gonna talk about how churches can do that. So first of all, people need to understand that this is a business. And I've talked to buyers and they have challenged me because I'm willing to listen. And they have told me, they've said, by the way, this is an example of a John Board chat where they're rating prostituted persons. This is the cleanest one I could find. Most of them are very descriptive. Is they tell me they have never been with a victim of human trafficking. I said, how do you know? And they said, because she was totally into it. Well, what they don't understand is if, they're, if the pimp gets a complaint, they're going to beat these um, victims. They, this is a business for them. So it's, and that creates more demand because the buyers think they're into it because they're acting. Okay, next. Uh, Jacob, next. So one of the things faith communities can do is do presentations for their men's group and destroy the fantasy, to let people know that they are victims and they can't tell the buyer that. I'm using 70% of prostituted persons. I've heard as high as 82%, Dr. Melissa Farley estimates, 82% of prostitute persons are victims of human trafficking. And in my experience, I've done a lot of research into this. Just to oversimplify it, buyers are in three groups. Let's call it three. One is just an average person, not really a, a, you know, a bad guy who does not know these women are victims. When they find out that they are, they stop buying. And we have found that to be true. Then there's the other side where you have the narcissist, the, you know, the misogynist, all those people, they don't care that they're victims. And they have told us that the only thing that would deter them from continuing to buy is a night in jail. So we should, you know, probably look at making that happen. And then we have another category, Jacob next, where you have someone who finds out they're victims, doesn't want to continue to victimize, but they are a sex addict and they cannot stop. I heard a very sad story when I was speaking at an event uh, where this woman told me the husband of her best friend was a sex addict and his niece became a victim of human trafficking. So he now understood that he was victimizing people by buying sex. And because he couldn't stop himself, he committed suicide. So, you know, it's very sad. And what the church can do is they have celebrate recovery programs, which talks to both sex addicts and their partners, helps them heal. Churches can do the Conquer series, which has over 90% success rate um, with getting uh, men to stop viewing porn. Porn is definitely driving this issue. So the church is really in a position to heal. That's their job. And this is an area where we can deter buying by having the church really uh, participate in this. Jacob, next. So another thing they can do is serve fair trade coffee. This is really trafficking in the third world. But I made up this flyer that churches can use. They can, uh, they can just put the name of their church due. So I've gotten many churches to serve fair trade coffee and tea after the service, to pass up flyers. I have it in a, um, 
a sign stand where they let people know how prevalent this problem is. And it's a great way to raise awareness because you can reach thousands and thousands of people this way. Thank you, next. All right, with regard to the community, with regard to the faith community, they're hesitant to be very vocal about legislation and that's understandable, it needs to be approved. But with regard to the community at large, there are some things that are coming around that we really should be paying attention to. One is uh, parents are very tired of having to monitor their kids so closely. I mean, it's exhausting. And we wanna put more responsibility at these gaming sites where children are being exploited and met with. And right now, if a child is exploited at a gaming site, you can't sue the gaming site. And that's understandable because they would all go out of business. But what the Earn It Act does is it says that if these gaming sites take responsibility and actually use technology to block uh, exploitation at their sites, then you still can't sue them. But if they're negligent and they're not doing something like using AI, and there's lots of great technology out there, then they can be sued. So this is not something that's happened yet. It's a bill that's up there. It was approved by the Senate committee. It will come up for a vote by the Senate and then move to Congress. But I personally am very excited about this one. Jacob, go ahead next. The other one that I am very excited about, because this really gets at the source of it, is to declare porn a national health hazard. Um, this list, by the way, you don't have to read everything on the list. These are the states that have passed it. You just want to notice that California is not on this list. And this is what it does. Two things about this. One is, up until now, porn has been in two domains. In the faith community, it's been in the domain of morality, you know, don't watch it, it's immoral, and the domain of free speech. And with that, we're stuck. We really can't do a whole lot about that because you can't teach morality in schools. By declaring porn a national health hazard and putting money behind it with regard to how destructive it is to marriage, especially to teens and everything else, then in the name of health, we can go into our schools and talk about it and start getting it. Um, at the source because violent porn and barely legal, barely legal porn is driving sex buying. So what barely legal porn is, it's when they take 18 year olds because it's legal to act in a porn film if you're 18. They take 18 year olds and put them in pigtails and have them act and talk like they're 14 and talk about how much they like having sex with older men. So this is creating a fantasy uh, which is why you have so many young people, 12 years old, 13, 14, 15 years old, because the buyers are watching this thinking that, you know, uh, teenagers are hot, which is creating a demand. So what the National Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation is doing is it's, it's taking out these various genres of porn and creating lawsuits to get them eliminated. Violent porn is another issue, how it drives buying is the sex buyer knows that their girlfriend or wife or whatever would never submit to some of the, their violent sexual fantasies so they buy a prostitute so this becomes their justification for doing it and you know violent porn to me is just unacceptable seeing women beat and kicked is just not acceptable and we need to eliminate it Dick up next so to end trafficking we need to mobilize the community Jacob for this one you have to click like three times so we want to show them what to do and how to do it, convince them they can win. People aren't going to participate unless they think they can win. And that's what I do. I mean, I have a whole presentation with the faith community on how to start a ministry, what works like that. And then they can take on activities at their places of worship, go out and share that with other faith communities, then create local faith coalitions with other churches so they can each support each other. Um, and throughout history, Whenever enough people are involved fighting an issue, once a critical mass is reached, we will win. We can end it. We have the power and resources to end it. We just need to mobilize our communities. Jacob, next. And last but not least, we need to pray. Uh, what a lot of people are unaware of is, uh, people are familiar with the song Amazing Grace. What they don't know is that John Newton, the author of the song, was an 18th century human trafficker, a slave trader. He grew up in the faith of his youth and became, but rejected that and became a really bad guy, was a horrible, cruel slave trader. But what happened was when faced with the storm at sea where he thought he was going to die, he prayed and he said, God, if you save my life, I will change my ways. And immediately the sea became calm. 
and he did change his ways and he actually became instrumental in helping Wilberforce end slavery in England. So next, Jacob. All right, this is the website where all my trainings are through godsgrace.com. Again, we have trainings for parents, flyers for fair trade, trainings for teens, how to start a ministry, what works to raise money for nonprofits, and many others. So I invite you to use those resources. Thank you very much. And thank you, Congressman Torres. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for uh, those remarks. Um, looks like we have a little bit of time um, for a few questions uh, from our attendees. Um, I do want uh, to go over one question that we got in, and it's just a pretty straightforward question. If we can have our panelists maybe just give like a 30 second to one minute answer to this. Um, someone wants to know, so what is one or what are one or two easy ways or simple ways uh, that they can participate in, in the fight to end human trafficking, whether that's education, whether that's and participating in a specific training, uh, what would you recommend from your individual perspectives um, would be the best resource? So I'll start first with Susan, since you just left. All right, well, if they're part of a faith community, there's many different ways they can raise awareness, like, you know, I talked about. If they're uh, associated with a school, lot of opportunities there. If they're community at large, I mean, I know people have set up tables at strip malls with information on it. A one group set up a table at the Huntington Beach Pier, and they talk to hundreds of people every weekend. So we're, the best way for them to get involved is education. Great. Thank you. Tamiko? Yes. Um, we actually wrote a booklet called Do One Thing because we believe that everyone can do one thing to end human trafficking. So it's on our website, which is everyonefree.org. Um, but one of the ways that we feel like people have really responded to assisting victims of human trafficking is putting together freedom bags, um, which are an emergency response kit or a backpack that we give to survivors. Um, and there's more about that on our Everyone Free site as well. Thank you. Deputy Jones? Um, I would definitely say have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with um, your own family, your own kids, nieces, nephews. Um, education has to start in the home and find out what your local school districts are doing. They are supposed to be training more and more kids or they're supposed to be training the, training the kids in education of sex trafficking. Um, so really start at home, find out what the community is doing overall, but get involved and educate yourself. Thank you. Uh, Deputy DA Santiso. Thank you. Uh, one way to create awareness is just tell at least one person about what you learned about today. Thank you. Uh, Christina. Um, definitely, you know, I think I would just echo the rest of the panelists is really educate yourself and educate others. Continue the conversation. Don't shy away from the conversation. I think it's calling it for what it is. You know, when someone says, oh, a child prostitute, no, it's not, it's human trafficking and they are victims, you know. Um, when someone says, oh, they're a sex worker, no, chances are that that person is trafficked or has been a victim of trafficking and they are doing what they know. So educating ourselves and educating them, but also volunteering and getting around. Um, with Project Sister Family Services being the local rape crisis center, we have sexual assault advocates, but now with us finding and starting to work with the Inland Valley's Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force, we are looking for volunteers that can help either stuff the bags with everyone free um, for those responses for survivors, or being willing to be a survivor to go out and talk to a survivor when they are identified and to help them provide them with that case management and that support to let them know that there is a light and that there are resources to get out of the life. Thank you. Uh, Lynn? Um, I think it's already been said, Jacob. Um, I, I guess the only thing that I would have to add is, 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 is talk about it. Keep mm -hmm. it out in the open and keep it top of mind. Um, and you know, as Greg said, talk to your family about it. And you know, it's, it's not something to be pushed aside and it's not something that happens to other people. Um, it, this happens. Um, and so the more that we talk about it and the more that we get it out there, the better it is. So I guess it just increased awareness. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, we do have a question uh, from Mario. He has a question about foster youth and obviously how foster youth um, are amongst the most vulnerable uh, to human trafficking. Uh, what uh, resources or what protections are, are in place uh, to, you know, that are tailored to these specific youth and, and you know, maybe these are answers that uh, the DA offices can give and the sheriff's offices can give 
um, how can foster youth be protected the most since obviously they're the most vulnerable? Deputy Jones or Deputy Santiso, I don't know if you wanna chime in on that. What I'll, I'll comment is, is I don't have a specific answer to that, but what I can say is that within LA County, we have what's called a first responder protocol. Whenever there's a, um, uh, a victim, a CSEC victim, a victim who's being commercially exploited or sexually exploited, there's a whole protocol that goes into place with law enforcement, with victim advocates, DCFS, and, and those agencies. And it's just a way to ensure that when a victim is contacted, they receive all the support and the services um, that they need upon contact. Um, I know that in our foster system and in our DCFS system, there is many advocates and representatives that work hard with victims who have been um, trafficked or at risk of being trafficked, um, but I don't have the specifics on that. Thank you. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that. If not, I can go to one more question. Um, I, I actually do. I can tell you because I've uh, worked very closely with them, the DCSF. One of the things they're doing is they're doing training for parents um, so that they have an idea of whether or not their foster children are being trafficked and what to do, which is really important. Uh, the other thing they're doing is um, if a child enters the, is in the system for any reason and they wind up being trafficked, they're doing a parent empowerment program to help pull these kids back because they keep running away again and, um, and to talk about it because for a lot of these parents, they can't tell anyone. They're so ashamed that, you know, tell people their daughter's a prostitute. So this becomes a support group. And, for, and I've talked to parents who've been involved in that and they, they have just told me it's just a godsend to have an opportunity like that and talk about it and to heal as a family because this issue your child gets involved in this, it tears the family apart. So they're doing a lot to heal the family and this protects that youth. Great. I'd Thank also you. like to add that for the state of California, um, there has been a Senate bill that's passed that is um, requiring that there be prevention education of human trafficking in schools. So I would definitely reach out again to make sure that the local school districts are complying with this um, state mandate, but also there's a lot of organizations such as local rape crisis centers, everyone free here in the city of Pomona, they all have prevention curriculum and efforts that we provide. Um, and I know that we work closely to provide those. And again, uh, we provide it, but again, sometimes the access to youth is a struggle, but it is mandated that youth in schools, in California schools, have this um, education before um, graduation. Great. Thank you all for, for those answers. Um, I think probably our last question, since it is almost 530, um, we do have a question here. Uh, how can volunteers get involved, uh, taking into account, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, and keeping social distancing and all that, that stuff in mind. Um, how are you, uh, all of you becoming innovative with your approach to, to volunteer engagement and education? So I will open the floor to, to whichever panelists would like to, to take a jab at that. So um, I could go ahead and start with Project Sister Family Services. We are providing our state training. So all of our volunteers have to take a 40 hour training to become certified which provides not just confidentiality, but privilege. So we won't be um, asked to share any information. We're not required to share any information that is shared one-on-one -on -one with the survivors. So we offer our training virtually um, at the moment. And we are also, for those volunteers that are willing and interested because, you know, in the work that we do is still going out and responding is necessary. Um, in some cases with sexual assault and human trafficking, we are providing PPE to those volunteers that are going out. Um, and making sure that they are also following all social distance measurements when meeting with the survivor, as well as providing um, survivors with PPE as well. Great, thank you. Any other panelists want to chime in on that? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for for that information and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Um, before we end today, I'll turn it over again to Congresswoman Torres um, to provide any closing remarks. Um, thank you, uh, Jacob. And most of all, I wanna thank every single one of you that um, participated in this um, discussion. Our panelists were wonderful. 
um, you know, they, they are each experts um, in, in so many different things, um, but very much work on this issue that they care about. Uh, and it is so obvious uh, by how they spoke about this issue and the victims involved. I think that one of the things that we have to work on as a community is the stigma uh, of human trafficking. Um, you know, we, they were, they were first, first we branded them as prostitutes and pimps and, and now, you know, they're victims. Um, and I think that we have to have a real conversation around that. Um, how do we deal with that? The question was asked, what can we do? Um, absolutely, talk to the kids. Um, especially the preteens, but we're not asking you to talk uh, to preteens about sex. We're asking you to talk to preteens about self-empowerment, about having um, the ability to speak to a trustworthy adult about the things that are happening to them um, specifically. If there is someone um, targeting them, being overly nice to them on social media, a neighbor, a cousin, you know, a fan, it could be a family member for, um, for all we know. And I'm sure the DA can talk to us about so many different ways that a, um, a young girl or a young boy could be, um, you know, put into a position where they are being trafficked. Um, the other issue that we need to look at is the branding, you know, that happens with these victims. Oftentimes, um, belonging to a or working for a gang member means that they um, have a stamp, a, some type of tattoo on their body. So when you're, when you're looking for, um, you know, potential signals of someone being a victim of, of sexual uh, uh, trafficking, um, look for those signs and, and don't be afraid. As I said, there's a stigma um, that comes with um, this, we used to call a profession, you know, of, of the century. Um, it, it is really, truly not a profession. Um, certainly a child uh, does not have a, a choice and, and, and cannot um, be given the sole responsibility of allowing somebody to perform certain acts on them or utilize their body on how they um, want to use their body. So um, with that, keep that in mind. Um, again, seek um, assistance from your church, uh, from your doctor, um, doctor's offices. I think there was a question um, in, in the thread about, you know, can our, um, we empower our local uh, clinics to provide that type of information? This is something that I have talked to, um, to several of our local clinics, and they do provide that information as they, giving, they are giving um, examinations to um, children, especially teenagers. I know that, you know, I, I, I raised sons. Um, unfortunately, I was not lucky enough to mother a daughter, but um, with my sons, once they got into their late teens and they went to the doctor um, for their yearly physical for sports, um, oftentimes I started in the room with them and some of the times I was asked to leave the room and that is so that a doctor can have that conversation with with the child and look for those types of, of symptoms or um, signals. So think about all of that and if there's any way that my office um, can assist you in connecting you with, with any one of our wonderful uh, panelists uh, feel free to reach out to my office, either the website taurus.house.gov or call us at 909-481-6474. Thanks again to all of you. Have a great rest, rest of the evening. Thanks for staying on so long. And one last thing before everyone leaves, I know a lot of people are requesting the contact information of our panelists. We'll go ahead and compile that and send that out as an email to all those that registered. That way you can make sure that you have that. Um, but with that, thank you all for joining us today. Hi.